we are going to pick up uh, on at least the trade and economics dimension of uh, what had, what was laid out earlier. Um, and to help us do that, we have a very uh, distinguished panel of uh, five speakers. Um, what I will do is we will go through the panel according to the program that, that you have. You have details about their, their, their CVs, their brief bios uh, in, in, the, in the, the packet that um, you would have received coming in. So I, I won't waste uh, time. In the interest of time, I think I won't get into, I won't read out uh, all the, the, the details. Um, but I will introduce them very briefly um, as they come up to give their presentations. So we will start with uh, David, David Dollar. Um, he's a senior fellow in the John L. Thornton China Center at the Brookings Institution. Um, so David, please. Uh, thank you very much, Joseph. Great pleasure to be here. I'm going to talk about the prognosis for the Chinese economy, and I want to make three points. First, China's economy is undergoing a transition. You could call it a difficult structural adjustment. Uh, it's going relatively well, but there's a lot they could do with policy to ease that along. Second, I'll say a word about the state of U.S.-China economic relations. And third, I'll say a little bit about the potential uh, summit meeting between Xi Jinping and Donald Trump and what might be accomplished on the economic side. So first, structural change that's going on in China's economy. Uh, for a long time, China's economy has been heavily dependent on exports and even more so on investment. Uh, when the global financial crisis hit, that was a big shock to China. The exports dropped very dramatically. And China responded with a stimulus that was almost completely investment. So it took an already high investment rate, even higher, up to about 50% of GDP. And that helped China maintain growth for a number of years after the financial crisis. But it's created problems now. Basically, China has built up excess capacity throughout its economy. You know, when you invest at that kind of rate, you're building up the capital stock at a phenomenal rate. And now they've got excess capacity in real estate, for example, lots of empty apartment buildings in third and fourth tier cities. They have excess capacity in heavy industry. It's operating at maybe 70% of capacity. And I would argue they've overbuilt some of the infrastructure as well. Now, in that situation, uh, naturally, the return to further investment declines, what we call diminishing marginal returns, and this has hit China very forcefully. So they're running out of good investment opportunities. And you see this particularly with private investment in China. Last year, it grew at only 3%. You know, so clearly, there's a problem finding good investment opportunities in the face of this excess capacity. So that's one of the fundamentals that's, that's leading to change in the Chinese situation. And, and I would argue the global economy is still relatively soft, and it's hard for China's exports to grow very rapidly. China's the biggest exporter in the world, so it's hard to have its exports grow any faster than the world economy. So some of the previous sources of growth are, are just not there. Now, the good news is that consumption is held up well. Consumption's growing quite rapidly, and I think there's a demographic foundation to this. Uh, so basically, China's Working age population has peaked. It's starting to decline. The labor market is tight. It remains tight. Wages have been going up quite rapidly. Consumption has been going up. Consumption is mostly services, and those service sectors are relatively labor intensive. So China has this virtuous circle going. And what you look at in the economy, what you see is very dualistic, that the service sectors are growing rapidly, and industry continues to be in the doldrums. Now, in the last couple of years, consumption has been d delivering about four and a half percentage points of GDP growth. And if China would just be satisfied with that, then this transition could go more smoothly. But the leadership is determined to get the growth rate up to six and a half percent. And so they keep pushing credit, trying to encourage investment. I already mentioned private investment was growing very slowly because there aren't a lot of good opportunities. But government investment, state enterprise investment, local government investment, all this continues at a very high rate. 
and the government's pushing on a string in a way in that there really aren't that many good investment opportunities. So you've, I'm sure you've seen these statistics about how debt to GDP is building up in the economy. It's rising in an alarming way, and there are financial risks building up in China. Now, the things China can do in terms of policy that would help reduce those risks and can help China continue to grow well, there are a lot of zombie state enterprises that are essentially bankrupt. The state needs to let these close and help the workers and the communities adjust. There are a lot of bad loans building up in the banking system, but you know, after all this, this, this investment, a lot of that's been backed by credit. They need to clean up the bad loans in the banking system. And then I mentioned that the service sectors are growing pretty well, but most of those sectors are relatively close to international competition. They're dominated by state enterprises, and China could help itself by opening up the service sectors to get more foreign investment, more private investment, create some new dynamic niches to balance the fact that there's all that excess capacity in traditional sectors. So that's really my first and main point, but it leads naturally to a second point to take a look at U.S.-China economic relations. You know, certainly during the latter part of the Obama administration, there was a lot of frustration with China that if China would pursue this agenda of dealing with state enterprises and opening up the economy, that in fact would create a lot of new opportunities for U.S. firms and workers. There are lots of restrictions in China's market. We see it across the board. 25% tariff on automobiles, so lots of American brand cars sold in China, but they have very little American content, to be frank. Uh, beef, other agricultural products, highly restricted. So while there's certain agricultural exports in the U.S., there are lots of other restrictions. And then I think the big one is that those service sectors I mentioned, you know, it's hard to trade services without foreign investment, and China's closed in financial services, telecom, media, logistics, healthcare. It's just a long list of sectors that China could open up, and those would create new opportunities for American firms and workers. Lots of frustration that we haven't seen much progress. Some people think that there'll be more progress with reform after the 19th Party Congress in the fall. I'm skeptical because Xi Jinping has been in power for four years, and we've seen very little reform in opening up, so I'm skeptical that we're suddenly going to see a big change uh, after the leadership transition, but I hope I'm wrong, and I hope we see more movement on the Chinese side. Now, I think to be fair, there are important areas of progress and one in the U.S.-China relation, and one area of progress that I would cite is actually the exchange rate. For a long time, China was manipulating its exchange rate and intervening to keep it low, and the evidence for that was China was accumulating reserves at a massive rate, ultimately built up $4 trillion in reserves. But that Chinese practice has changed over the last few years. China's currency is appreciated more than any other major currency. If you look back 10 years, the trade-weighted exchange rates appreciated about 40%. And recently, China has been intervening to keep the currency high, not low, and they've spent a trillion dollars of reserves, so that stockpile has declined to $3 trillion. And this is actually quite helpful that China has been intervening to keep its currency high. It's actually playing a stabilizing role. And you know, behind it all is the whole issue of the trade surplus. China's overall current account surplus had gotten up above 10% of GDP back in 2007. It's come down very dramatically to about 2% of GDP in the last couple of years, including in 2016. So definitely there's been progress in the relationship, but a lot of frustration. So let's think a little bit about this upcoming summit meeting, which may be as soon as two weeks. Uh, I, think, uh, you know, I think we heard from the first speaker a good point that it would be awkward to delay this sort of thing right now. Uh, hard for me to believe that they can do the kind of preparation that would actually lead to outcomes, and so maybe outcomes are not so important for our first summit meeting. You know, during the campaign, candidate Trump talked about currency a lot, said he would name China a manipulator on day one. He hasn't done that, and it seems unlikely the U.S. would follow through on that threat because China, in fact, is not manipulating its currency. As I said, it's intervening to keep the currency high, so it would be inaccurate 
to label China a manipulator at this point. But there was also talk of very high tariffs, 45% mentioned at one point, 35% I believe mentioned at another point. Certainly, the administration's indicated it's unhappy with the trade relationship uh, between the two. So far, we haven't really seen any move to follow through on those high tariffs. Uh, I think it's kind of an empty threat because tariffs at that level would be quite damaging for the U.S. economy. You know, we economists have this nice theorem, learner theorem, that an import tax is equivalent to an export tax. And what that means is that if you impose a high tax on imports, a high tariff, you're making your partners poorer, your own exchange rate typically appreciates, and it becomes harder for you to export. So it's purely economic theorem that you may think you're taxing imports, but actually you reduce your own exports. So if we go down that road, we might create some jobs in some specific sectors, but we will lose jobs in other sectors, and there's no presumption that there would be a net benefit. There's, there's going to be a net loss to the whole country. Now, that is all true whether or not China retaliates. But one thing I feel pretty sure about is if the U.S. does any significant protectionist move, China will retaliate, and that just multiplies the negative effects I just talked about. So I think it's, it's not really a credible threat to talk about those high tariffs, but that, that issue's still there. Now, coming to the summit, it would be smart for China to preempt some of this protectionist sentiment in the U.S. by opening up some more markets. As I said, I think it's in China's interest to be opening these markets. They might come in with a list, open up beef, open up health care, parts of financial services, that would be a very positive surprise and a positive shock that would diffuse some of this protectionist sentiment. I don't really expect that because I think it would be hard for China's decision making to put that kind of package together in the next two weeks. So I think it's more likely that we won't get specific outcomes out of this summit. We'll probably get some general language on the economic side about the two working together uh, to try to reduce the imbalances and open up Chinese markets, et cetera. Uh, but we probably won't get anything very specific. And while our panel's not talking about North Korea, uh, certainly there's a risk that we'll get something similar in the security realm, not really any specific outcome, just some nice talk about continuing to cooperate together. I worry that on the economic side, if that really is the result, no real outcome, uh, that probably will fuel some of the protectionist sentiment that's still here in Washington. I hope we won't see any harsh protectionist measures. As I said, they're quite self-destructive, but we may very well see some moderate protectionist measures. So I wouldn't be surprised if we had somewhat chilly economic relations between China and the U.S. over the next couple of years, but let's hope we don't have a trade war. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Uh, next, can I invite uh, Dr. Kazumasa Iwata uh, to, to the podium? Dr. Iwata is the president of the Japan Center for Economic Research. Please. Yes, uh, thank you very much. I'm very much pleased to be here to talk to, to you on the prognosis for the Japanese economy. I want to make uh, uh, three points uh, my talk. So recently, Prime Minister Abe and President uh, Trump met together in February and uh, took initiative to start the uh, bilateral dialogue relating to three uh, yeah. I Okay, uh, then. And uh, uh, I identify the three areas for the dialogue. First one is the monetary fiscal policy. Second one is uh, energy and infrastructure and the cyber issues. And the third one is the trade issue. Uh, on trade issue, I, I'm going to talk at IS. Yeah, IS uh, to, uh, talk tomorrow, economic integration. So therefore, I would like to concentrate on the monetary fiscal policy uh, in United States and Japan. And uh, uh, 
its implication for the future growth of both countries. And the first point I want to make is uh, what is uh, going on on this monetary and the fiscal policy under the name of Abenomics. I distinguished the three phases of Abenomics. It started Abenomics, first phase, in December 2012, and the three pillars consisting of aggressive monetary easing, this is a so-called quantitative and qualitative monetary easing policy, and a flexible fiscal policy and the growth strategy aiming at, at, at achieving the 2% growth rate. And inflation target is 2%. There are two numbers of 2%. One is inflation, another is the real growth rate. And the second phase um, started October 2015. Now the a policy direction is uh, moved to revitalize the 100 million society. That implies the Japanese government to want to stop the declining population and maintain the size of the total population, this uh, 100 million. And also uh, increase the birth rate from 1.4 to 1.8 in order to achieve this uh, 100 million society. And also zero leave work for elderly care and also set the target for nominal GDP by the year to fiscal year 2020. The nominal GDP uh, 600 trillion yen. On the monetary policy side, there had been an introduction of QQE, quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, with negative interest rate in January 2016. And the third phase um, started uh, summer 2016, after the uh, government party victory in upper house election. Now, in this phase, Prime Minister Abe postponed the consumption tax rate hike to October 2019, and also putting more emphasis on the active fiscal policy expansion. On the monetary policy side, introduction of QQE with yield curve control. Yield curve control implies BOJ set two policy targets. One is short-term interest rate, set at the negative 0.1 percent. This is a negative interest rate policy part. But the new, uh, another long-term interest rate, set at the zero percent, uh, uh, that implies uh, VOJ want to control this yield curve as a whole. Uh, but the combination of this uh, um, a targeted uh, long-term interest rate combined with expansionary fiscal policy. I remember the experience in the United States in the period 1933 and 34 under Roosevelt. At that time, the Federal Reserve uh, took rather conservative monetary policy. But the fiscal expansion really uh, worked to move out U.S. economy from deflation. Therefore, at that time, fiscal action was the driving force uh, to increase the inflation rate. And another episode is the 1942 and 51. At that time, the government has set a, a ceiling on the long-term interest rate and the short-term interest rate. And the fiscal expansion triggered by the Korean War, you know, this uh, accelerated inflation rate significantly. This time again, the main uh, driving force of inflation was fiscal uh, policy. So uh, I find, therefore, this uh, introduction of this uh, a QQE with yield curve virtually implies a regime shift of BOJ policy from QQE type reflation focusing on the monetary based expansion to the uh, a fiscal theory of price levels. And uh, this is a relatively new theory, but this theory says the price level determined not the monetary policy, but fiscal policy, given these uh, two uh, episodes in 
United States. And recently, Professor Seamus visited Japan and organized our center organized symposium together with him. At this place, Mrs. Uh, Professor Seamus argued, oh, BOJ has not achieved yet the 2% actual CPI. It's uh, still uh, only 0.1% in the most recent months. And the target is 2%, so why the difference? And why BOJ failed to achieve 2%, even though adopted so expansionary QQE policy? And the professor seems to argue, oh, this is uh, because of the consumption tax rate hike implemented in uh, 1914, uh, April. And the fiscal aspect was neglected. Therefore, a BOJ has not succeeded to achieve 2% inflation target. According to this theory, the inflation is not the monetary phenomena, but the a fiscal phenomena. And based on this recognition, uh, Professor Shimus argue, okay, then the Japan should postpone the consumption tax rate hike scheduled October 2019 and also temporarily suspend the fiscal target to achieve the primary budget deficit to zero in the year fiscal year 2020. And uh, only after achieving 2% inflation target, fiscal policy should be oriented toward consolidation of budgetary balance. So uh, he uh, recommended this kind of policy for a fiscal policy in Japan, and the reaction among politicians, for instance, uh, Finance Minister, Mr. Aso, argued both the helicopter money proposal and also this uh, fiscal theory of price level. Uh, I strictly reject both of them because he's afraid of the destabilizing fiscal balance over the future. So, uh, on the other hand, how about the uh, Prime Minister's position? Yeah. Prime Minister had the bitter experience. He implemented the uh, uh, consumption tax rate hike 2014 and April. And what was the impact on this uh, uh, a, a to this economy? This is a very serious impact on this uh, solid line in the consumption. A uh, large negative uh, rate of return appeared after the consumption tax rate hike. And the blue line shows, according to this uh, fiscal theory of uh, price level, what is important is not the money, the uh, real, real money balance, real monetary base expansion. This is the lower you know, column. And the battery some of this uh, government bond outstanding and the base money matters for the determination of price level. And the development is uh, like that. And if you look at this uh, a rate of change of the sum of uh, real monetary base and the government uh, debt outstanding, uh, they have, if there is a sharp decline of this uh, blue line, then we see a sharp decline of consumption. So, uh, therefore, uh, the, a Professor Sims argued, okay, sh should we a postpone it, this uh, another consumption tax rate hike and also implement this uh, fiscal target by the year 2020? The Prime Minister's position is somewhat different, I see. This is uh, um, a it has uh, given this bitter experience uh, of this consumption tax rate hike uh, previously. So um, I find that there may be the possibility the Prime Minister make a decision, uh, likely before the general election, which is scheduled at the end of uh, um, 2018, next year. And, uh, uh, I, my, in, my, in my view, uh, there is a possibility uh, to postpone this uh, consumption tax rate, uh, second uh, consumption tax rate hike uh, in Japan, and also postpone the attainment of this fiscal target, zero primary 
budgetary balance in the fiscal year 2020 and reset the fiscal target. Uh, maybe the debt GDP ratio, not the primary a budget balance. This is the primary budget balance in Japan, and it's very likely, even though the target is to have the zero primary budget deficit, but according to assessment, it's almost impossible to achieve this. And instead of this, maybe Prime Minister will focus on this public debt nominal GDP ratio and stabilize it and reset it. So given this uh, monetary fiscal policy, how about the implication for the policy coordination between the United States and the new administration and uh, Japan? The first implication on monetary policy, for the time being, it's uh, very likely BOJ continue this uh, expansionary monetary, pol policy, uh, monetary policy to maintain the zero long-term interest rate uh, for coming months and uh, possibility uh, longer than that. On the other hand, Federal Reserve already raised interest rate and this year likely to raise another two times in, and uh, this creates a difference in monetary policy stance between the two countries. Monetary expansion in Japan and the U.S. is a tightening direction. The implication is on the exchange rate. There may be an effect on the yen rate to depreciate. And I hope new administration in the United States should respect the central bank's task to maintain the price stability. In the case of Japan, to achieve the 2% inflation target. And the US as well. Even though there is some spillover effect on the exchange rate. This is the first implication. And another one is fiscal policy. As I said already, in the third phase of abenomics, our government is already oriented toward the expansion of fiscal policy. And uh, a new administration in the United States, still uh, a lot of uncertainty, but we are hearing they are going to carry out the uh, tax cut significantly and together with massive increase of infrastructure investment. I find uh, both uh, Japan and the United States and other advanced economies face the risk of secular stagnation. One indication of the secular stagnation in the case of Japan is uh, very low uh, natural interest rate. This is the equilibrium real interest rate, which uh, indicates neither acceleration nor deceleration of inflation rate. This is the neutral equilibrium interest rate. This natural interest rate in Japan is now negative. Uh, this is a uh, uh, natural rate. Uh, we are estimated this uh, negative 0.7%. United States is also very close to zero, according to the estimate by uh, President Williams, uh, Federal Reserve San Francisco. That low natural rate indicates very low trend growth of per capita consumption. And this is uh, indicating the existence of secular stagnation. I find uh, both Japan and United States uh, should uh, overcome this secular stagnation by adopting more expansionary fiscal policy. This is, uh, uh, both countries have the same direction, and uh, there is a uh, room, you know, for this uh, coordination in the field of fiscal policy. So that concludes my remark. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Dr. Iwata. I think so far we're doing uh, uh, pretty good for time. Um, next up, we have, uh, let me just check my list, uh, Pro Professor Pravin Krishna, who is the Chung Ju Yong Distinguished Professor of International Economics and Business at Johns Hopkins uh, University. Thank you. <coughs> Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me, I'm going to, so I'm talking about the Indian economy and the U.S.-India uh, relations. Uh, I'm going to make uh, three points. I'm going to talk about three sets of things. I'll start with a bit of background on the Indian economy as it stands today. Uh, talk a bit about 
the news that's coming out of Washington, how it impacts India, what the reactions are. Um, and I will conclude, I think, by saying that uh, India does see or there's some concern about uh, things that it's hearing from Washington, but that for most part, uh, the focus in Indian economic policy has been um, has been on kind of its own domestic reforms, and to a large extent, I think it's, that's that's appropriate. So, so let me start with a bit of background on on just the Indian economy, where it stands. As, as you all know, it's a large country, uh, the third largest in the world on a, on a PPP adjusted basis, a little over eight trillion dollars. Uh, the GDP per capita is nevertheless quite low, five thousand five hundred to six thousand dollars or so. Uh, and it faces a number of important uh, developmental challenges. Okay, so I'm going to give you two sets of statistics that I think capture well uh, the kind of the broad Indian economic policy challenge. The first of these is that in India, agriculture takes up about 50% of the workforce, uh, and it employs, it generates about 17% of, of GDP. So about 17% of output is, is kind of generated by 50% of the population, relatively unproductive sector. The manufacturing sector uh, has been relatively stagnant, and despite all of the policy reforms and changes that have been undertaken over the last uh, 15, 20 years or so, uh, manufacturing has been stagnant at about 15% uh, of GDP. Uh, agriculture hasn't declined gradually over these years, uh, but that decline has mostly come, uh, has been kind of matched by the expansion of services rather than the manufacturing sector. So that's one point, just kind of the structural breakdown of the economy, largely agricultural, and there's a question of how do you move away from that in other, uh, other directions. Uh, second important point, and that one that's uh, kind of the kind of top of the list of concerns, in a sense, for Indian policymakers, is the fact that India is, is a relatively young country. So about 30% of its population is under 15 years of age. Uh, and this is, this is important. This is crucial. What this means is that there's going to be, there are going to be significant demographic pressures um, on the labor market. Uh, you're talking about roughly uh, the need for the creation of one million new jobs per month uh, in India that need to be created to accommodate uh, the young uh, who are already there in the system. Uh, this translates into roughly 120, 150 million jobs uh, every decade, and that's, that's the size of the U.S. labor force. So you're kind of adding the U.S. labor force. You need to add the U.S. labor force every 10 years, uh, which, is, which is a very big challenge. Where do you employ all of these people? Okay, so services is one answer. Uh, it's, a, it's a tricky one, kind of high wage services require highly skilled workers, uh, which we're not able to supply in, in kind of adequate numbers, not able to train as many workers. Low wage services are a problem because they're low wages and generally low productivity growth. Uh, and so that is the, that is kind of the broad Indian challenge. How do you transition out of agriculture? Uh, with that background and looking at the success of kind of countries in the region, uh, in East Asia, uh, clearly, uh, an expansion of the manufacturing sector is, is one, one important answer, and recognizing this, the Indian government has been pushing uh, pretty hard, uh, especially in the last few years, to try and make India a more efficient space uh, for production at the kind of the low, for domestic markets, as well as uh, for, for international markets, for exports. Most of you have probably heard about the Prime Minister of India's Make in India campaign. Uh, to incentivize production in India, and as at a practical level, this has meant many different things, many different reforms that they've attempted to push. One of these is easier acquisition of land for industrial development projects, uh, reform of labor markets to make them more flexible, improvement of physical infrastructure in the country, uh, streamlining the process for the entry of FDI into the economy, uh, and very importantly as well, the harmonization of internal taxes within the country, the elimination of kind of tax differentials within the country to eliminate, to improve internal efficiency and kind of eliminate the bottlenecks that are very common pervasive kind of goods getting stuck at state borders waiting to be taxed by different states at different rates and so forth. The progress on this has been mixed. Uh, the government or the government party is close to being successful, I think, in, in kind of bringing about this harmonization of internal taxes, the, the GST reform as it's called. Uh, they have uh, decided to devolve these decisions about land acquisition, labor, labor flexibility uh, to the states, decision making over rules about land and labor uh, in a kind of a competitive federalism model in the hope that some states will adopt these reforms, do well and be kind of uh, other states will want to emulate them. But overall, I think it'd be fair to say that progress has been slower uh, than many have hoped. And at some part, this is because the, the governing the government did not have 
uh, kind of a full majority in the political, political space. They had majority in the lower house, but not in the upper house. And that, interestingly, looks like it might change given the recent electoral victories at the state level uh, that the party has enjoyed. It's likely that they will now have numbers, both in the lower and upper houses, to be able to push reform through uh, relatively quickly. So, so this is the Indian framework, the background. Uh, it looks like the moment is ripe for some important reforms to roll forward, uh, but it, it's, all of this is happening at a challenging time uh, from, an, from an external perspective. It's almost as if you're kind of all ready, dressed up, ready to go to the, to the nightclub, and it's, uh, it's 1.59 a.m., and people are actually coming, coming out, and the doors in the club are being shut, so you know, what are you supposed to do? And so this is all the protectionist sentiment uh, that has gained uh, political traction in the United States and Europe, so the question for India is going to be, where will the America First framework of the Trump administration, where will that meet the Make in India campaign of the, of the Indian government? And, and that's, that's, uh, that, that creates its own questions. There's a lot of uncertainty about what actually means, uh, what, what's going to be implemented in terms of kind of the America First uh, framework. And so it's hard to say much that is, uh, that is very specific. The one thing that we do know is that the U.S. has withdrawn from TPP. And there's a question of how does this matter for India? How did India see this? And I think that's, that's an interesting issue there. Um, on the one hand, India's trade with TPP countries was quite large in the kind of the 20 to 25 percent range. So significant set of countries, the TPP countries, a significant amount of trades for, trade for India. But this was not such a major concern in India, even as it was kind of rolling forward for its exclusion from TPP was not a major concern uh, for some important reasons. The first of these was that the TPP countries, the member countries of the TPP, many of them already had free trade agreements with each other. Okay? So the fact that this was going to be consolidated did, did not necessarily mean that much. Uh, the countries that did not have uh, agreements with each other uh, had relatively low trade barriers, so that, that was one issue. Second was that the price of admission into TPP was so high uh, as to be unthinkable for India in, in now or in the near future. So it wasn't even something they, were, they thought if they played their cards right, they might get in or something like that. It was just the TPP template uh, did not sit well especially with the Indians, especially uh, when you think about kind of labor regulations, what it required. Uh, more importantly, perhaps the role of state-owned enterprises. Uh, the, these kind of the differences were large enough to preclude uh, the possibility of entry. Uh, a parallel negotiation, so, so, so the fact that the, UP, the U.S. has kind of withdrawn support with TPP, um, there wasn't that much worry about being excluded in the first place, and so the fact that TPP has been rolled back is not that, it hasn't changed things that much in the way that the, that the Indians think about this. There's been a parallel negotiation, as many of you know, uh, that has been started, led by China, the RCEP. Uh, and there's a question now about how, what, what that actually, what, what these changes on the TPP side mean for uh, RCEP. Um, India's own position was a relatively cautious one and even approaching RCEP negotiations, there was lots of concern about kind of the surge of Chinese imports of goods that would come into the Indian market and that would somehow derail any progress they might make on kind of the Make in India campaign. And it was, there was a worry that Indian kind of comparative advantage in services would not be strong enough to offset uh, comparative disadvantage in manufacturing. And so there was a cautious sense about RCEP anyway, uh, how Chinese incentives change uh, with this kind of withdrawal of TPP towards pursuing RCEP is a question that's uh, kind of yet to be seen a bit. It's perhaps too early to tell. And, and I don't have a clear sense of how India views this either in terms of the, the, the changes. Uh, be all this as it may, and as important as trade is and being kind of this export platform um, is as a part of a kind of broader Indian development strategy, uh, TPP and RCEP have received relatively little attention uh, in, in India. Okay? And much of, kind of the headline attention has been kind of confined to one or two issues. Uh, one of these is the H-1B visa issue and, and the big proposal that's now being discussed uh, that will impact the Indian IT sector is the increase in the thresholds of income levels uh, below which one will have to go through additional steps in order to prove for firms in order to prove that a worker importing a worker from India was, was necessary. And this is seen as something that's going to be costly for Indian firms, whether they're directly sh sending workers from India to work here or whether the multinational firms are bringing in workers themselves. Uh, it, it's, it's going to be, it's something that, that will be a challenge. Uh, the second issue that is going to cause some concern is the border adjustment tax issue. So there's a question of clearly it's going to have uh, some negative effect on, on Indian, Indian exports. 
uh, which may or may not be offset by dollar appreciation. That's a question of how much the dollar will appreciate uh, in, in, you know, once the border adjustment tax or if the border adjustment tax is implemented. And the fortunes of firms are also going to be quite different depending on whether they're just simply exporting, whether they're multinational firms, whether they're going to enjoy some benefits from lower corporate taxes in the U.S. and so forth. Uh, and so this has caused some level of concern in India. Uh, there's some discussion about all of this. Uh, some commentators, including and kind of CEOs of these firms, have also said this may be, there's a silver lining to all of this. Maybe we need to kind of take a look again about, at our own business practices and maybe rethink the way we do things and stop thinking of ourselves as a kind of a body shopping enterprise and be more creative in terms of our own organizational structure of how we base ourselves in the U.S., how we manage our resources there or in India uh, to get around and kind of fully join uh, the kind of the international space, uh, so to speak, um, rather than be worried about kind of changes in policy on these H-1B uh, type of margins. Uh, having said all this, I think, I think it'd be fair to say that all of these are in my view at least, sort of seen as, as blips rather than the issues that have dominated uh, Indian sort of politics and Indian uh, economic d discussions uh, in, in the last few months. Much of the focus there continues to be on what India can do itself in terms of its own domestic reforms on all of these different dimensions that we talked about, infrastructure, land, labor, and so forth. Uh, and I think, I think that, is, that is only appropriate. I think much of what India's success will rest on its ability to go through with these reforms and a, to a smaller extent uh, on what's happening externally, especially uh, things that are coming out of Washington. Uh, let, me, let me stop there. Thank you. Uh, and next up, we have we have Dr. Karen Peter Dumrongkit from uh, the Rajaram School of International Studies in Singapore. Karen. Okay, well, first of all, thank you, Brookings, for inviting me to join this um, um, conference. Um, I'd like to, uh, in my presentation today, I'd like to talk about the Trump's um, economic policy and how they, gonna, if they are going to affect um, Southeast Asian economies, and how will Southeast Asian countries collectively respond to the challenges. Okay. So um, I think as, as we all know now that the Trump uh, administration um, tr are trying to carry out the campaign promises of make America great again or American first, adopt American first approach, bring create job creation, etc. So um, so in 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 this uh, in Southeast Asian region, we asked uh, what would gonna affect. Um, what what would be what would be affected by this uh, by the Trump administration policy? So of course, well, Trump is now saying that he's not isolationist, but we think that um, he may uh, he's leaning toward adopting a mercantilist um, approach to trade issues, and also it can lead to a U.S. lesser role in multilateral. Um, institution, right? Because um, Trump said he's not keen to um, to go forward with multilateralism, um, multilateralism, and also, it, uh, of course, kind of, yeah, the U.S. has already withdrawn, for, withdraw, withdrew from the Trans-Pacific Partnership (TPP), and the NAFTA is uh, still he's threatened to uh, perhaps withdraw from NAFTA or may, perhaps renegotiate NAFTA for a better term for the U.S. And maybe we are seeing in the future more, uh, more bilateral trade agreement being being signed by the U.S. and other countries. Okay, just to uh, maybe briefly just to show you that this this slide is to show you that the uh, president has uh, 
many leeway to uh, to influence the trade policy. As, as you know, we have a Trade Act of 1974, which provides several sections. For example, the Super 301 or Section 301 says that the U.S. can um, slap tariff on on uh, due to the fact that other countries are adopting and fair trade practices toward the U.S. Also, Section 122 also say that the U.S. can put up trade barrier in case of the balance of payment problem. Okay. And also, uh, for, and another one is the Trade Expansion Act of 1962, which says that uh, the U.S. can put up trade barrier in case of um, the trade conduct that are hurting the U.S. material interest. Right. It is just to show you some example. Okay, so in 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 Soviet Asia, we asked, well, okay, what would be the effect of the Trump administration policy like, um, toward um, ASEAN, and how um, and what would be the effect on our economy? Okay, so first of all, uh, perhaps if uh, the new the Trump administration rolled out more protectionist measures toward. Um, toward um, Southeast Asian exports, so we're going to witness the reduction of our export to the U.S. But I'd like to point out here that um, the effect may not be that much because our share of the share of total export, total trade to the U.S. is only 10.9%. But the effect may vary um, according to the trade openness of individual Soviet Asian country. For example, you look at Singapore and Vietnam, um, it ex nine eight percent of it, their total export are going to the U.S., while only about um, six percent of Malaysian exports going to the U.S. And also um, Thailand and Philippines are less exposed to the U.S. Okay, so for, uh, another effect would be we could witness the reduction of the Soviet um, of the U.S. Um, FDI into ASEAN. Okay. Uh, this effect is also not, not going to be that dramatic because we rely on the U.S. FDI only 11.3 percent of the total FDI we receive uh, from other countries. So we receive um, FDI from within ASEAN, FDI from EU and Japan more than FDI from the US. Okay, so um, an another, another concern in the region is that perhaps the US-China, um, the possible of the US-China trade conflict or war would, would um, eventually affect our economy. For example, if the US decide to uh, put up trade uh, barriers, such as tariffs, onto the Chinese product. Well, he can do it by, um, he can do as he said, that he's going to slap 45% tariff on the Chinese product. Or he can just, uh, or the Trump administration can just cite the Super 301, right? Just say that the U.S. would like, the U.S. just want to roll out the trade remedies against the unfair trade practices by the, the Chinese. And he can do that. Or he can just, uh, or Trump can um, undertake managed trade by going to the individual firms and coerce them to not to source intermediate goods from China, right? just to source uh, these goods from inside the U.S. just to make American worker keep their job. Right? He, there's so many levers that he can do. So, so if there's some um, um, protectionism being weighed on China, so um, that could uh, that could invite retaliation by the Chinese, and the target would be the likely target would be Boeing. Oops, sorry, Boeing or soy soybeans or wheat, right? Because soybean wheat you can just get it from elsewhere, like Canada. Okay, or retaliation can be in terms of non-tariff barriers. 
And um, so what would, what would this, uh, the, this U.S.-China dynamic affect ASEAN? Of course, it would affect ASEAN because we have a lot of links with the China, with the China, China's economy via the global value chain. Uh, just to give you some, um, some sense of how linked it is, about 50% of the Chinese export to the U.S. are the value-added component sourced from the Southeast Asian economy about 50%. Yes. Okay, um, so the next, uh, next thing I'd like to talk about is that how, how would be the, uh, because the U.S. withdrew from the TPP, and how, how would um, Southeast Asia um, continue to enhance the regional trade architecture in the post-TPP world, right? So, um, okay, because, um, just for, so for this slide, um, the U.S. Uh, withdrawn from the TPP. How would Southeast Asia see it? Right. So it, uh, we see, we saw it, we see it as uh, opportunity loss for the U.S. to take a lead in the trade rulemaking, and there are some doubts of the future of U.S. engagement to the region, and pos and perhaps a possibility of some of Southeast Asian country are going to lean toward China. Because if you look inside the TPP agreement, TPP agreement has the chapter that helps facilitate capital flows across country. And without, so without TPP, China may fill the void by boosting um, investment in the region instead. Okay, so here's, uh, so here I outlined the solution. So the response, the, the likely response by by Southeast Asian country in the post TPP world in propelling the regional trade architecture forward. So one is to complete um, our project of East of ASEAN Economic Community. The second is to pursue RCEP. The third one is to uh, pursue free trade area of Asia Pacific or FTAP, but in a longer term. And the last one is to enhance the ASEAN plus three process. Um, the first solution, the first response would be is um, um, because the, there's no TPP in the region, how can Southeast Asian economy going to deepen our globe, uh, the supply chain? How can we enhance our trade cooperation further? So one way is to complete AEC because, uh, well, there's uh, many reasons, there was many uh, reasons to complete AEC. So one is to, of course, deepen the transproduction, trans production network in the region. And also it's gonna, it, AC is gonna help boost our intra-ASEAN or regional trade further. Because if you look at the statistic, uh, the intra-ASEAN trade has been stagnant for more than a decade. So in order to move forward, we need to lower barriers, we need to lower the non-tariff barriers and harmonizing rules and regulation even more. Okay. And, um, and also, um, if we can complete TBP, um, ASEAN can collect, can gain an up, upper hand in the negotiation because we can collectively say that we have a bigger regional market to, uh, as, a, as a bargaining chip in the trade, and trade negotiation. And there's some, and in, inside ASEAN, there's some incentive, another incentive to complete AEC by the, by the end of this year is because it's going to coincide with our. 15th anniversary of the ASEAN. Okay. The second one is uh, the second response to keep the trade cooperation forward in the region is to pursue RCEP. So just to give you, um, um, just to point out here that the, um, in contrast to some media that try to say the RCEP is us is China led, is this actually not? It's actually uh, ASEAN led. Because if you look at the guiding principle and objective of the uh, guiding principle and objective of negotiating RCEP, it said that um, the RCEP talk had to be carried out by um, by on by keeping us in centrality intact. And also, if you look at the eight working group inside the RCEP negotiation, they all chaired by ASEAN countries. Okay, so. Um, there's some shifting dynamic if you look at after the Trump administration decided to withdraw from the TPP, as uh, 
RCEP in the region has become, for the regional state has become a immediate priority. If you take a look at um, the leaders' um, comments, right? For example, Prime Minister Abe said, if "There's no doubt that there will be a pivot to RCEP if TEP doesn't go forward." Malaysia Trade Minister also said that Malaysia would focus effort on TPP after Trump pulled out from the. Oh, I'm sorry, Malaysia would focus effort more on RCP, right? And Australia also say the same thing. If TEP fail, the vacuum would, would be filled by the RCP, right? But um, of, co of course, then uh, this uh, dynamic would may help RCP agreement at the end because it can help boost the quality of the agreement. Because because without RCP, those the, uh, this, these seven countries, Australia, Brunei, Japan, Malaysia, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam, who are inside both TEP and RCEP, they have to recalculate and perhaps um, hedge on, more on RCEP to boost uh, regional trade. Right? So these seven countries are likely push for talks about, to push for higher quality of the final RCEP agreement. So they, they have been pushing for talks about government procurement policy to deal with um, SOS, SOEs. Okay. But there's some challenge facing RCEP though. If you, take, if you look at the agreement, RCEP is trying to consolidate uh, exist, five existing FTA um, that ASEAN has signed with the other state. But that's, the difference are very large, so they must have been ironed out first. And, and, and also state negotiating in RCEP have different development, developmental stages and also different level ambitions. Some would like to aim for higher quality, some would like to aim for lower quality. And also RCEP is the first time that the big, big economy meet together and try to crank out free trade agreement, right? especially China and India. This is the first time that they have to come together and try to figure out how to do FTA together. So that's a challenge. And another challenge, which is an important one, is the lack of leadership in the negotiation. There's no, sing, there's no clear champion in terms of who's going to lead and who's going to um, persuade or perhaps coerce other states to go on board with the RCEP, uh, in the RCEP negotiation. Okay. okay, another um, solution that um, Southeast Asian economy could respond is to, um, to, is to go forward with free trade area of the Asia Pacific. This uh, project is under APEC and it has been um, put on a higher profile by uh, the Chinese championship in 2014. Okay, but from, from the ASEAN's perspective, FTA AAP P is a longer term goal because we are, the, 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 as I say, the main priority right now is to try to finish the RCEP negotiation first. And then another reason is that FTAAP still lacks substances. There are so many pathways in how to build TVP from perhaps from RCEP or from other trade, trade agreement. And also if, if, we, if, if we would like to go forward with FTAAP, that's going to be some membership issue because FTAP is under APEC project. But some of ASEAN, some of ASEAN country, Myanmar, Cambodia, Laos, are not inside and RCP and also India are not, are not inside APEC, sorry. So then member, APEC has to accept these four countries first in order to uh, go forward with FTAP. And also, um, um, some APEC countries, if, if, if you want to build R, uh, FTAP from RCEP, there are some countries in APEC that are not in RCEP negotiation, and they may have different ideas of how to uh, create FTAP. So it's a, that, that's why it's, uh, it's a very long term, FTAP is a long ter longer term goal for, from the ASEAN perspective. Okay. So the last one I'd like to highlight is that, um, and the, the, is that um, there will be, there'll be some, that, um, because, the, because there's been some fear in the region that the Trump administration fiscal stimulus and also the expected federal rate hike would, uh, cr would trigger a finan financial outflow from the region back to the U.S. So um, 
So one of the response that Southeast Asian country can do is to enhance the ASEAN plus three process of financial cooperation, which, uh, which, compo which for example, they can enhance the uh, Chiang Mai Initiative multilateralization uh, agreement, which is agreement to provide short-term li short liquidity support to the member countries um, in, in time of the liquidity, liquidity problem. And also, um, also perhaps um, ASEAN can also help advance the Asian bond market initiative. This initiative uh, helps um, recycle saving within Southeast Asian countries so that um, we can be reliant on the capital from the US. Okay, and um, okay, there's some talk about wh whether the regional trade cooperation would be fostered by the TPP 11, right? But that thing, uh, that, that thing has to, but this one, if it, it, it would go forward, the Article 30.5 has to be adjusted, right? Because Article 30.5 said that at least six countries had to, six countries combined, uh, which combined had to ratify the the agreement, but the C country GDP has to combine has to be at least 35 percent, 35 percent GDP, right? And and the, the U.S. is the only one that because it, because this clause doesn't directly say that it requires U.S. ratification. But if you look at the 85 percent GDP threshold, you real it really needs the U.S. to be inside that uh, these six countries. No. But Okay, whether this article will be adjusted or not, it depends on how, depends on the state calculation because state interests vary because inside TBP, among the TBP 11, some states have, already have FTA with the US, for example, Singapore, uh, Chile, Australia have bilateral FTA with the US, Canada, Canada uh, Mexico also in the NAFTA, FTA with the US. But there are some, there are those um, others who are not having FTA with the US, right? For example, Malaysia, Japan, Vietnam. So these, these group of country interests vary. And I think um, going forward, we have to see how different interests um, would interact and how each other, how each individual country would convince others to, to go on board with what they want, okay? Okay, and I think I'll end my discussion here. Thank you. Thank you, Karen. Uh, and our final presenter uh, today uh, is Professor Yu Son, who is the chair of the Center for Japan Studies at the East Asia uh, Institute. Also dean and professor of the Graduate School of International Studies at Yonsei University. Thank you very much. Uh, my name is uh, Yol Son uh, from East Asia Institute and in, uh, Yonsei University. Uh, yeah, I'm honored to be able to uh, join this uh, conference. Um, thanks to uh, Richard and, and Suk Jong for uh, invitation. Uh, my uh, presentation uh, is about uh, Korean economy, but not all aspects of Korean economy, but trade. Uh, in that sense, I uh, continue trade policy uh, uh, as uh, the previous uh, panels uh, said about that. Uh, but in doing so, uh, uh, okay, um, yeah, the, the, uh, my presentation, first uh, I'll um, talk briefly about uh, South Korea's economy, which is uh, still export-oriented. Uh, there are several risks. Uh, one is obviously Trump risk um, and also China risk. Um, and then uh, I'll speak uh, about uh, trade regime in Asia Pacific and finally uh, uh, the task uh, uh, ahead for South Korean government, uh, next uh, South Korean government. Um, 
GDP growth rate uh, of South Korea has declined uh, substantially, progressively. Uh, now 2.7, and this year is, uh, which is projected 2.5. Um, it's the uh, 11th largest economy in the world. Uh, in terms of trade volume, it is seventh. Um, so, uh, and then uh, trade in, in GDP ratio is uh, 85%, very high uh, compared to Japan, 30, uh, you know, 7, 8%, United States even below. Um, so in that sense, it's still uh, it's a trading state, prototypical trading state. So the trade environment is very important for uh, Korean economy. Um, like I said, uh, the GDP growth, uh, you are familiar with uh, Korean history, modern contemporary Korean political history. Uh, the GDP growth rate uh, during the 1980s, 7.4 down to uh, 5.1 in the Kim Dae-jung era, 19, uh, from 1998 to uh, 2002. Next, uh, 4.5, and then 3.2. Um, last year, under uh, Park geun uh, government, it's 2.7, so steady decline. And this year, uh, like I said before, it's projected 2.5. Um, and uh, you look at uh, that... Uh, and uh, we also see, uh, which is, is matched by the corresponding decline in export growth. Uh, this is a world uh, growth rate uh, of, of, I mean, uh, growth rate of world trade, uh, you know, entering, uh, you know, 2010, uh, the, you know, uh, the growth rate uh, significantly declined. We all know that. Uh, and uh, you know, this year, last year, uh, the trade volume has been the lowest since the global financial crisis. Um, and Korean exports, uh, when you look at that, the, the growth rate um, has decreased uh, steadily, um, like you said, uh, particularly uh, since uh, 2014, the volume itself has decreased uh, you know, as your growth rate decreased as well. Um, and we can think of uh, several factors. One is sort of you know global protectionism uh, since the global financial crisis, uh, but we also look at um, you know several uh, sort of momentum uh, external shocks, uh, mostly from uh, I mean the first two cases from U.S. economy, um, and that affects Korean uh, you know trade obviously. Um, now. Uh, the main point, uh, America, so uh, Trump risk. Uh, I think uh, this part has been, um, you know, said before. Uh, you might think of uh, the Reagan period, uh, the Reagan uh, night uh, trade policy toward Asia, Japan, South Korea, and other countries, uh, which is called, this is Bhagwati's term, aggressive unilateralism. Um, so you want to rebalance uh, trade, in other words, you know, rebalance, uh, the, I mean, uh, correct uh, the balance of trade uh, between the United States and your trading partners and level playing field, et cetera. So most of these discussions, um, yes, it's about protectionism, but uh, also equally about, you know, opening up the foreign markets by using your, you know, trade laws and asymmetric power. But this time is um, different, uh, you know, so far what uh, the Trump administration, administration um, has said, it's more like economic nationalism, you know, buy American, hire American, which uh, sounds very much nationalistic, and, and this is uh, quite uh, familiar uh, to the Japanese, to the Koreans historically, because in this economy, and also Prussian economy, from the 19th century, uh, but it is uh, really unheard um, uh, in, in the case of United States, but now we are hearing that. So uh, aggressive unilateralism, frying open the foreign market, and also you protect your own market as well. So that's really a concern for the countries like South Korea, trading state. 
Um, and the uh, USTR's recent report, I don't want to uh, repeat all these things, but it, it's uh, quite um, strong words on it. Um, and that uh, leads um, us to uh, the South Korean case. Uh, according to that report, uh, trade deficits, uh, I mean, America's trade deficit, it's kind of, you know, criteria of targeting, you know, other countries or existing, um, I mean, renegotiation of, of uh, or updating of uh, existing FTAs. Uh, in Korea, it's uh, Koros FTA, Korea US FTA. Um, and the second is if uh, United States uh, designate Korea as a currency manipulator, that's another concern, but that concern has been waned. Um, and uh, another uh, concern is uh, lots of you know trade remedies, um, and particularly uh, concerned about the border adjustment taxes uh, that has been coined uh, in this country, and um, suspect if uh, the current administration uh, you know apply uh, implement uh, this tax system um, in the near future then that's going to be a um, huge impact on Korean trade. Uh, so first, uh, this part is about, uh, you know, Coros FTA, renegotiation of Coros FTA. Um, I have a lot of uh, slides on it, but uh, most uh, of these slides come from, I mean, I uh, took it from uh, AmCham Korea. Um, they say, I mean, we had a, a conference last uh, last week. Uh, it was a fifth year uh, anniversary, uh, Coruscant University conference where I attended. And uh, AmCham's view is this is a good deal. And uh, we don't really understand why uh, Washington <laughs> think differently. Um, so there's, there's a gap between uh, American businesses in, 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 um, in Seoul and USTR uh, or White House. Uh, so these are the data that uh, trade uh, balance. When you look at the trade balance, uh, actually uh, the you know commodity merchandise trade balance has uh, sharply decreased uh, in in two years, but service in, uh, surplus for the United service uh, trade uh, for the United States that sur uh, surplus has increased. Um, let me quickly go over. Um, and the South Korea is uh, the lowest trade balance deficit among the America's major trading partners. Uh, these numbers are not mine, it's from AmCham. Um, and this one is also uh, increasing US, um, Korean investment in the United States and increasing number of uh, people employed in the United States by Korean companies. Um, so uh, these are uh, the facts that the uh, United States uh, tried to renego renegotiate uh, this, you know, Coros FTA, which um, has been regarded as a good deal from both countries, and then, uh, you know, might uh, be worried because uh, any sort of, you know, major wholesale renegotiation would uh, cause unnecessary, um, you know, political uh, conflict uh, from the Korean society. Second is China risk. Uh, yeah, very simply, uh, Korea, I have two minutes. Uh, Korea uh, heavily relied on Chinese economy, trade in particular. 26% of Korean exports go to China, where, um, you know, eight, only 8% 8 of Chinese exports come to Korea. So there's a classic case of uh, asymmetric interdependence between uh, China and South Korea. So more political leverage go to China, and then we see uh, Chinese retaliation, uh, economic retaliation, um, you know, all come from this, you know, the structure of asymmetric interdependence that uh, China can exert uh, retaliation, but South Korea cannot reciprocate because you have uh, less, uh, you know, cars to um, counter. Um, so uh, these stories are quite familiar, and, and this is um, kind of, you know, uh, one thing that uh, has been frequently mentioned is that uh, in East Asian, 
economic growth, uh, you have seen the you know uh, kind of you know principle that separate economics from politics uh, since Deng Xiaoping period. Um, that really helped uh, Chinese economic growth and also helped all other um, you know East Asian countries. But that has been violated uh, in the Senkaku incidents and also that issue these days. So that's uh, been a concern. So uh, South Korea, I mean, later, uh, I mean, next page, I'll, I'll skip. That uh, you need uh, uh, multilateral rules that, uh, you know, regulate, uh, you know, these trade uh, activities within the region. Now, um, TPP, um, you know, it, it's the same story as uh, the previous uh, panelists uh, discussed. Uh, the one um, concern is bilateral deals. Uh, United States want bilateral deals with Asian countries, but bilateral will not fully address new development in regional production systems and value chains. It's quite obvious. Um, so uh, you need uh, multilateral rules in the region. And um, also at the same time, you see China um, in, in Davos Forum, uh, they claim um, that uh, China will, you know, defend, uh, you know, global globalization, um, you know, free trade, etc. But um, in this very specific case, particular risky case um, in Korea, China is using um, uh, unconventional methods to uh, press uh, South Korea economically. So you need to establish multilateral trade rules. Uh, and hopefully re-engage United States in, in multilateral deals um, in the near future. So the next government's task, I'll summarize, um, I summarize it in five points. Number one, uh, help establish rule-based rule order. Uh, and here the rules are multilateral rules that apply every uh, member of the countries in the Asia Pacific. Uh, and work uh, proactively on, on RCEP, CJK, FTA, and Korea-Japan FTA as well. And um, this, uh, you know, Korea and Japan, if uh, Korea-Japan uh, actively, proactively work on Asian deals, that might induce United States to come back to the regional um, multilateralism. And um, uh, one last thing, uh, yes, uh, the rebalance China trade, it, it's a... Uh, Tall order, obviously, um, is not uh, cannot be the outcome of, of uh, government policy. But uh, I think uh, the trend will be uh, going into that uh, direction. And finally, South Korea needs a more effective uh, trade policy control tower that uh, connects uh, many different uh, segments of uh, Korean society from strategic interest to uh, commercial interest into one control tower so that you can manage, uh, you know, big powers uh, trade policy. My, uh, so I'll stop here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Can I invite the panelists uh, back up uh, to the, the table? We have, uh, well, 15 minutes, so not much time. Um, I think we covered a lot of ground. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take questions in groups so as to try to get as many uh, questions as possible. Okay. Yes, can I have the, the first question, please? Yes, uh, sir, over there. Uh, yes, yes, you. You first. Okay, you're next. Uh, uh, yes. Sorry. Um, I'm Bill Brown. I'm uh, retired from the government, but I teach a little bit at Georgetown. question is for David Dollar. Uh, thanks a lot. A terrific little uh, illustration of what's going on in the Chinese economy. I found it very, very useful. Um, but I teach on Chinese economy, so that also it helps me in my teaching. One thing, though, I feel um, very kind of bad about in teaching, to tell you the truth, and you brought it up, the little factoid about uh, Chinese auto taxes, 25% tariff on U.S. autos to China. The comparable one for a, a Chinese car coming here is 2.5%. Uh, from Mexico, zero. From Korea, zero. I mean, U.S. tariffs are almost zero, uh, except for North Korea, maybe. But generally, our tariffs are so low. 
Uh, when you see a, a tax like that from China on something as important as automobiles, it's not yet, but by, we know it will be five or ten years from now. That, to me, just cries out for a bilateral deal with China. All this multilateral business, that's MFN-based. That protects everybody's existing rates. Um, so I I'm, I'm, guess I'm getting a little frustrated, all this talk about TPP and multilateralism, when we see over time this, tr this huge imbalance with China and a 25% tariff on something like autos. Uh, you know, I'm for free trade. I think the administration, so everybody the question, says please? free trade. Uh, so, is that a question there? So my question okay. is, how do you see a 25% Chinese tariff as anything to do with free trade. Thank you. Uh, uh, at, at the back, just behind, yes. Uh, hi, uh, Barry Sterland from Brookings Institution. Uh, it's a question, uh, I think, for all of you. I think we've focused a lot on trade architecture, but the other big thing, I think, about the economic impact at the moment, and some of you touched on it, is the macroeconomic situation in Asia. We saw Japan hasn't got much room to stimulate policy more. Chinese policy is quite constrained. Korea has its own sort of political constraints. The rest of Asia is probably a bit more stable and can, can take some shocks, but very dependent on those global value chains. Do you think that thinking of just how the risks would play through Asia to both America's friends and its, um, its other partners, how, would that affect the way they think of imposing a trade shock or or that to the region. The sort of the, the, the chance of something like that bouncing back on the US own, US's own interests through magnifying some of the vulnerabilities in those major Northeast Asian economies, do you think that's present in administration thinking and even um, the congressional thinking about these issues? Sorry, was that uh, for a specific speaker? No, it, it's or? really across the board. Across, Just the, okay. It's putting that trade shock in the context of the macroeconomic vulnerabilities. Okay, we'll take a third question. Um, at, at the back there, yeah, you're almost there. Yep. Yes. Yes. Thank you. Um, I was wondering, theoretically speaking, if six countries out of the TTP were to push on, what incentives do these countries have to take on some of these higher standards in the TPP? Since part of the selling point of the TPP, at least here domestically, was that the U.S. could use its leverage to draw. Um, better bargains on higher quality uh, trade agreements. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, back to the panel. Maybe David, you want to go first? Uh, so, on the first question, you know, how do we reconcile 25% Chinese import tariff on cars with free trade? Well, that was part of China's WTO agreement. And in particular, you know, they were negotiating with the U.S. to get our agreement that they could join the WTO. This is 15 years ago. So the negotiators at the time must have felt that that was an acceptable compromise. There are lots of other protection measures that were left in place in China. I think it's fair to say the WTO agreement was an enormous step forward in openness back in 2000, 2001. And we assumed it was the beginning of a process in which China would continue to open. But my experience in the last 15 years is frustration that China's done almost no further opening. So at this point, it really stands out. And there are other, you know, there are other uh, examples, but it's part of their free trade agreement, their WTO agreement. So, you know, we and European partners and others, you know, have to try to negotiate something better with China. But we don't have much leverage because, as I said, the big guns like following through on a very high tariff you know, it's going to hurt our partners. We heard from ASEAN. It's going to hurt our partners because the value chains are very complicated. It's going to hurt our own firms, right? And it's going to hurt our exports. Uh, briefly on the, the second question, uh, my, my quick reaction to that is, you know, that the China's macro situation, as I said, has a lot of vulnerability, risks are building up. So I'm not sure the new U.S. administration has thought about what happens if you come in with some harsh or even just moderate protectionist measures, that may very well contribute. I won't say provoke a financial crisis in China, but that might contribute to the fragility and you may end up with some kind of financial crisis in China, which will make it harder for everybody up here to grow. 
Yeah, just to add to that, I guess on the second question about uh, U.S. policies and macro fragilities abroad, in the context of the border adjustment tax, sometimes they sort of talk about, you know, there's going to be a dollar appreciation that's going to offset the taxes. And so for anybody kind of operating on the trade side of things, this is neutral. Uh, the dollar appreciation will fully offset the tax differentials and so forth. Uh, that may be true for trade, but a 25% or 20% appreciation of the dollar is going to have a very different macro impact uh, for a whole lot of firms uh, in Asia and China who, are, uh, who have dollar exposures but don't have, uh, don't have their earnings in dollars, for example. So the, so the kind of thing that happened in the uh, late 1990s uh, could well, very well repeat itself if you have a, a kind of a situation of this sort which has not been fully thought through, in, in my understanding. Anyone else want to take a stab at the second question? Or the TPP. Or I, thought, the TPP. I thought some of the colleagues would want to do the TPP one. Oh, yes. Um, on TPP, uh, let, let me just uh, introduce a Korean case. Uh, Korea, um, I mean, you, you had uh, already have bilateral uh, FTAs with uh, 10 TPP member countries, um, but Japan and, and Mexico. Um, so uh, initially, uh, the country uh, didn't really have an incentive to get in uh, because you already had. And so your incentive was to, you know, exploit the existing bilateral FTAs until uh, the you know full TPP has been, um, you know, completed, and then you hope that it should. It would be a protected, I mean, a protracted process. Um, but as you, you know, as, as the negotiation got, went on, uh, you realized that um, there are trade rules that address the new, uh, you know, uh, international uh, division of labor, where, you know, the production has been made uh, by production blocks, and those blocks are geographically dispersed in the region, Asia Pacific, so that. Uh, you need trade rules that regulate those, you know, service links and production blocks to be connected more effectively. So it, it's more about it's, uh, the traditional uh, trade uh, policy and trade agreements is about liberalization of the economy, open up others' market and things like that. But it's more about the trade rules that govern the economic activities uh, within the region. And this country, I mean, Korea, has realized that this is a really big deal, and so you really wanted to uh, get in. So that's the aspect of uh, you know the multilateral uh, uh, trade agreements that um, that really serves the, the interest of uh, the countries like Korea, economies like Korea. So I want to make one comment uh, on the relationship between the macroeconomic policy and the financial market the fragility. I find uh, in the global world economy, one of the fragility uh, is the high leverage uh, by corporate sector of emerging economies, notably China. China's uh, corporate debt nominal GDP ratio is uh, now 170 or more than that. This uh, level is much higher than the Japan's bubble period, and uh, if the U.S. Uh, Federal Reserve tightened the monetary policy. That would enhance the capital outflow from China. China, PBOC, uh, Central Bank of China, may be forced to raise interest rate, uh, but this aggravates the problem uh, because uh, already high leverage and the corporate must repay the debt, but the interest rate rise then the resolution of uh, non-performing asset becoming more difficult. So this is one uh, global financial imbalance problem. Another one is uh, uh, even among uh, advanced economies, swap market, uh, Euro, uh, United States, and also the uh, a Japanese yen and the US dollar. Uh, there is a swap market rate. Uh, significantly widened. Normally, it's uh, close to zero, but today we see 60 or 70 basis point. This implies a shortage of uh, dollar liquidity. If Federal Reserve further tighten, and uh, possibly at some stage, they will cut the balance sheet, size of balance sheet. Uh, 
Uh, already we had seen the tapering shock under the uh, Chairman Bernanke, and uh, there is a possible risk there. And if the uh, um, Federal Reserve um, hurry up this process of raising interest rate and uh, cutting the size of balance sheet, then this would aggravate this dollar shortage. And the swap, currency swap market is uh, indicating a very serious problem. When I, this is my personal experience, uh, in the uh, 2008, there had been a liquidity shock appeared on the euro market. And uh, at that time, swap market didn't work, that swap market between dollar and the euro. And this led to the next year, the a establishment of central bank swap arrangement. And in order to stop the widening, you know, this uh, spreading imbalance on the financial market, there is also this indicate the potential risk uh, in the global financial market. Yes, maybe I just add sh uh, one short comment on TBP. Um, because, um, well, if you look at ASEAN, um, if you look at the, uh, the nature of business in ASEAN, um, SMEs are the backbone of ASEAN economy. So the proportion of, <coughs> proportion of business that they are SME can range from 70% to 95%. In the, um, so it's, it's, it's a huge number. And TVP, one, one thing that it will help um, ASEAN participants in this trade block is that it has a chapter on e-commerce. So e-commerce chapter would, en would enable ASEAN SMB to join the global value chain. Yes, yes. No questions? Uh, yes, at the, at the back, right at the back there. Thanks, uh, Rob Colorino, uh, we're an investment group. Could uh, someone from the panel speak a little bit with respect to uh, debt and a little bit of, um, of default recognition by the banks? I think you know, that's come up a bit in China and some other places. Be, uh, be interested in that, please. Any other yeah. questions? Uh, no, if, if not, um, someone want to take a stab at that? David, I'm looking at you. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, uh, you know, as several of us said, the, the debt to GDP has risen in an alarming way in China, and uh, it, particularly in the corporate sector. Uh, you can anticipate that some of this debt is going to go bad. You see it a little bit in China's statistics on non-performing loans, but frankly, they have a rather low standard for including something as a non-performing loan. So the actual problem is probably several magnitudes larger than what's suggested. So economists, you know, we believe in tough love. I mean, you should go in there and start resolving this. I think China should raise interest rates. I'm happy they, they made one step to raise interest rates when the Fed made the recent move because they've been issuing too much credit. So you've got to raise the price of credit and you're going to force some of these firms to go bankrupt, but that's the reality is they don't really have a viable future. I'm a big fan of social programs to deal with the workers in the communities, but don't bail out firms under capitalism. That's, that's my, my basic rule. So they, they need to get in there, uh, and they're doing a little bit of it to be fair, but they're moving pretty slowly, and because it's a political year, they certainly don't want to upset the apple cart this year. So probably not too much... Um, movement this year, but hopefully after the 19th Party Congress, we get some more action on this kind of reform. Mike, oh, there we go. Um, thank you very much to all the panelists. Thank you to Joseph for chairing. Uh, I think you've uh, laid some good benchmarks now, and now I'd like to ask Wu Xunbo to come and introduce the uh, final panel for the afternoon.